Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Uh, and uh, I'm honored to, to open this uh, science talk of the symposium in honor of my good friend and colleague, uh, Vera Rubin. Uh, I want to add my welcome to everyone here to this very exciting uh, program. You saw we have an excellent program on dark matter and cosmology. I know Vera would have loved to be here today to hear all the exciting new developments in the fields that she has worked uh, in for uh, many decades. And I know that uh, she is here with us uh, in spirit and I know she will enjoy this symposium in, in, her, in her honor. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, about where, where is the dark matter located? That's of course something that Vera has worked on uh, already 50 years ago or so. We'll start with her and I want to show you also some new results that we have on where is most of the dark matter in uh, the universe uh, today. So let me start uh, with a few words about uh, Vera Rubin. So Vera was uh, a good friend of mine for uh, more than 40 years. She was obviously a pioneering astronomer, and we'll hear more about her pioneering work in astronomy uh, during uh, these uh, few days. She worked on dark matter, rotation curves, galaxy dynamics, and she was enormously passionate about uh, her work and her science. She was uh, an in inspirational leader, uh, an inspirational mentor, and she was a role model for generations of uh, astronomers. Uh, some of you are here today. She was, as we already heard, a champion for women in science. Uh, she helped many women in science uh, work on, her, uh, on their uh, science and, and uh, progress. And she had enormous passion for science for family, her family, uh, for just knowledge and learning in general, enormous integrity and enormous compassion. She was warm, kind, courageous person and a lot of fun to be with. And she was always, I was impressed how cheerful she was, how enthusiastic she was, how positive she was about everything uh, that was happening around her. And with all these uh, enormous achievements and acc accolades, to me personally, the main, main thing that uh, relates to me is she was my good friend for so many years, and I was just delighted to spend time, many, many hours, much time with her during the years both here in Washington and later on uh, when she was in Princeton. So let me show you some uh, early pictures, sort of fun uh, early pictures. Uh, this is from 86, so that's uh, more than 30 years ago. Here are young Vera, young Netta, <laughs> Margaret Geller, that's on the uh, Great Wall of China uh, with some symposium in astronomy uh, at that time. And that trip was just a wonderful uh, trip that I vividly remember. Here is another fun uh, picture with Vera, I think that must have been in the 90s from uh, the uh, Carnegie Observatory. It's Vera, myself, uh, Judy, uh, Vera's uh, daughter, uh, our friend Virginia, who is here, and Wendy. Here is a picture uh, that uh, I love. I have it hanging on my office wall in Princeton. That's a picture, uh, a recent picture, more recent picture from 2004. Uh, Vera Rubin and her husband Bob, myself, and John. And that was at the NAS, at the National Academy of Science in 04 when Vera received the Watson Medal, I was a chair of that committee, 
She received the Watson Medal, and John received uh, the Comstock Medal, and we had really wonderful uh, time at, uh, at, that, uh, at that meeting. Okay, so here are some of uh, our various uh, early work, and this is the famous uh, M31 rotation curve that uh, Vera and Ford did in 1970. That rotation curve was done from stellar uh, rotation uh, of uh, stars in the M31. And uh, you see, and as they, uh, Rubin and Ford show here, uh, the rotation curve going only to about 24 uh, kiloparsecs, but that was far at that time, and it doesn't drop as much as one would have expected. It kind of flattens out, and this is their figure of what, do, what does this rotation curve do to the mass, and you see the mass increases, and it still keeps increasing. It does not flatten out as you would have expected if there was no additional dark matter. So one would have needed some additional dark matter to uh, uh, account for the rotation curve that they observe. And that uh, work has started this uh, big uh, discussion of rotation curves. And here is a little bit later in the 70s by uh, Vera and Ford and Thonard. You see many rotation curves. They are just flat, as flat as the eye could see at that time. This goes to about 50 uh, kiloparsecs. They are all flat, and the mass just keeps uh, growing. It's dark matter. Now, we also uh, remember that uh, Mort Roberts and colleagues, starting way back in the 60s, 66, and the 70s, and throughout, use uh, H1 rotation curve from uh, neutral hydrogen to measure the rotation curves uh, of the gas around galaxies. And they have found flat rotation curves uh, similar to what uh, Vera and for, uh, Ford uh, found with the stars. And both of those are consistent with each other and with a need for additional dark matter. But with the gas, there was also a question, maybe the gas the velocities are not fully uh, following the um, potential. And with the stars, there are not that many uh, problems. It was clear that you needed something to do it. But uh, Vera always uh, acknowledge in, in their papers that uh, Mort Roberts and collaborators uh, have shown the flat rotation curves and the need for dark matter. And here are some more of the flat rotation curves. And again, it is really quite remarkable to see in those early days how flat all these rotation curves were as far as one could trace them at that time, which was about 50 uh, kiloparsecs. What I'll show you today from some of the new results, that this flatness of the mass continues beyond the 50 kiloparsecs all the way like to the end of this auditorium to maybe 300 kiloparsecs or so, which is really quite astounding. We should also remember that uh, in the 70s, 74, both in Astro et al. Uh, and uh, also Kerr Peebles and Yachil at the same time showed using the data both uh, in, in uh, uh, this paper both from rotation curves of uh, Vera Rubin and, and Ford and others, as well as binary system, that the mass, because of the flat rotation curve and the binaries, does increase uh, as you go to larger scale. And a similar thing was done by Enasto uh, and uh, uh, Kasich and Saar. And of course, all of that confirmed what, as we all know, what Zwicky said way back in the 1930s using the comma cluster from the velocities in the comma cluster that you need a lot of dark matter in, in clusters. Uh, that was ignored or not believed for several decades until finally these flat rotation curves 
from uh, neutral hydrogen and from the stars uh, and from binaries required everybody to understand that dark matter must exist. Either that or we change Newton's law, which nobody or almost nobody wanted to do. Uh, okay, so the same uh, type of thing was then put together in the mass to light uh, ratio versus scale by Davis et al. in 80. And here what's plotted is not just the mass, but the mass per unit light. And we'll talk about that in a moment. As a function of scale, here is 10 kiloparsecs. Uh, that's a scale of a typical galaxy. 50 kiloparsecs, rotation curves. Here are groups and uh, are binaries and small groups of uh, galaxies. Clusters of galaxies have much higher mass per unit light. So galaxies have about mass to light of 10. Our stars have mass to light of 1. Galaxies have about 10. If you go farther, it will have a little more. But groups have mass to light of 100. Uh, clusters have mass to light of about a few hundred. And the interpretation was that the mass to light, of course, increases with scale. As you go to larger scale systems, you have more mass per unit light. And here is omega matter would be one if the mass per light was a, a little over 1,000. And the idea at that time was, in the 80s, well, we just go a little bit more, we'll get omega matter one. And that was the common interpretation at that time. And the other common interpretation that some, some people still believe today, and I'll show you that that's not uh, uh, exactly so, is that as you go to larger scale system, from galaxies to groups to clusters, the bigger system are more dark matter dominated, means they have more dark matter per unit light. Of course they have more dark matter, but there is also more light in it, more stars, more galaxies. But they are dominated, that was the interpretation, they are more dominated by, light, by dark matter than by light. They have much bigger uh, halos relative to the light in them. And I'll show you that this interpretation is not quite uh, correct. So uh, the mass to light ratio, for those who are not so familiar with it, in fact, that's what Zwicky used in the 30s to show that the mass relative to the light or the mass in the stars is, is uh, much bigger than uh, uh, needed uh, by the stars. So the mass to light tells us how, how and where is the mass distributed, because you see how the light, the galaxies, the stars are distributed, and you are measuring the mass by some methods. We'll talk about some gravitation, gravitational lensing that measures the mass directly. So you look to see how the mass is distributed relative to the underlying galaxies of the light. And uh, you can find out how it changes uh, uh, with scale and with location. Dark matter. <laughs> uh, and it, it can also tell us what is the total amount of mass in stars compared to the total mass. And it can also be used to determine the mass density of the universe, and that's one of the earliest uh, methods that we use to determine the mass density of the universe to be about 0.25 or 0.3 or so, uh, rather than the one that was expected at that time in the 80s. So here let me show you um, one of the results that we have uh, it was uh, my students Lori Lubin and uh, Vika Dorman in the 90s. And then this is a plot that uh, uh, we did with Shaoui Fan that shows the same type of figure that I just showed you, the mass per unit light as a function of scale. And again, here is 10 kiloparsecs, uh, 100 kiloparsec, 1 megaparsec, 10 megaparsec, going into the bigger scale. The blue, uh, the blue images are spiral galaxies, so we separate it to spirals and elliptical galaxies. The elliptical galaxies, as we know, have higher mass to light ratio. So that was not separated before. Here when we separate it, 
and we trace the same spiral galaxy measure using mass from different methods, we see that the spiral galaxies continue with either rotation curve or gravitational lensing or binary system all the way to maybe two or 300 kiloparsecs. So are elliptical galaxies, but they have higher mass to light ratio because they are old galaxies, their light had decayed over time, no new star formation, so their mass to light ratio is higher. But one thing that immediately was apparent to us that groups which are in red, groups and the clusters are here at one megaparsec, groups are just in between the ellipticals and the spirals. Unlike what the previous uh, assumption was or intuition was, that groups have much more mass per unit light than galaxies, this told us that's not so. Group are mixed, a mixture of spirals and elliptical galaxies, and they are just made by the mixture of the spiral and elliptical galaxies. They don't have more mass per unit light than individual galaxies do. It's just that the galaxies continue to much larger scales of about 200 or 300 kiloparsecs. And that is indeed the, uh, approximately the virial radius of uh, normal uh, L-star galaxies. And clusters, which were at a mass to light of about 300 over here, and that's thousands of clusters, uh, are mo made mostly by elliptical galaxies, as we know all galaxies, and they have higher mass to light ratio. And that's mainly the reason why clusters have higher mass per unit light ratio, because they are older. Their light is lower in any band that you use, no new star formation, and that's why they have higher mass to light ratio, not because they have more mass, they just have the mixture of ellipticals and spirals together. And this result was not in our early paper, I just added it here to show the really nice result from uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey Lensing that falls right on where uh, we found it. And here we uh, said mass to light flattens out, and that tells you approximately what the mass density of the universe is. So the conclusion from that paper, and I'll show you some new results uh, now, is that the mass per unit light does not keep increasing. It flattens on large scale, where m is proportional to uh, the light, and that's at the end of the dark matter. We reach the edge of the dark matter distribution. It also tells us that the ellipticals and spirals produce most of the mass to light of groups and clusters, that clusters and groups do not have additional dark matter than the galaxies. So larger systems are not necessarily more dark matter dominated, unlike what was uh, believed before. And that uh, most of the dark matter is in, in very large halo and galaxies, and of course Vera Rubin's work, as we saw, started it by seeing the dark matter in the inner parts of the halos of galaxies, and this continues it all the way to uh, 10 times the scale, as we said, all the way uh, further on. And let me show you some uh, new results uh, with uh, my student and, um, Andrea uh, Coolio using Sloan Digital Sky Survey and using masses directly from lensing from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, by uh, looking at a huge number, uh, 160,000 groups and clusters full of dark matter, uh, measuring the mass from lensing, luminosity from the uh, survey, and get the mass to light uh, function from it similar to what uh, I showed you before. So this is the mass per unit light, similar to what I showed you before, cumulative within a given radius, against going from 10 kiloparsec, 100 kiloparsec, one megaparsec, 10, and we go all the way to the cosmic scales of 30 megaparsec. So when you go to cosmic scales of 30 megaparsecs, you're going into the large scale structure of the universe you are going into filaments and voids and superclusters, all the things that are happening on uh, large scales. 
So what, you, what do you see? Ignore for a moment the top curves. You see these curves are in three different colors, but they all rise from about 20 kiloparsecs all the way to a few hundred kiloparsecs, and everything flattens out on large scale. This rise is the same as various rotation curves. Mass increases with light when you sit on the central galaxy up to a few hundred kiloparsecs, but beyond it, no matter where you sit, on a single galaxy, in groups, in clusters, any place, it flattens out. Mass knows where the light is. It follows, the dark matter follows the light. This increase is based on BCG, brightest cluster galaxy. That's where we sit on a brightest uh, object in the system. When we take out this galaxy, take out the light, these curves become these curves. So this is just the mass around this. Uh, or the, the, that just in, it comes in because you sit on the light of the brightest cluster galaxy, and it pulls you down. You take out the light, and it flattens out. And if you take out the mass, it becomes totally flat. The difference in colors is just sitting on very poor groups and medium groups and the richest clusters. And we understand why there are some differences here. I will not get into the details. This is the same thing uh, in units of the virial radius of the system. And we take out the central object. And you see that it's totally flat. In fact, there is slight decrease. And uh, the decrease is what you expect just from the stellar population in the system. Uh, or what we call the density morphology relation. There are more ellipticals in the centers and more spirals out. And we, in fact, see, we see the mass to light of the different uh, uh, populations, stellar populations in this system. This is the same thing, except it's not cumulative. It's just local, so you have bigger schedule. But that's a mass per unit light at any given scale. And you see it's flat other than the stellar population effect, which is a small factor, uh, all the way to 30 kiloparsecs. Again, mass follows light remarkably well. Here you see the mass profile, light profile, and uh, the galaxy distribution profile, remarkably similar. And if you uh, all remember, if one measures directly gravitational lensing and superimposes it on the light, that's exactly what you see. The mass from the lensing follows the light distribution. Here is one recent cluster from the Hubble Space Telescope. You see the light distribution, and the contours are the mass, and they follow each other remarkably well on the large scale. Even here in the bullet cluster, the lensing are in the contours, follows the light remarkably well. And that's what we are finding num uh, numerically, quantitatively. You can also get omega metal uh, from that. And you see the mass to light is the same every place you look, no matter what system you look, once you look at large scale. And we get uh, uh, the 0.26 that we obtain. And one thing that I want to show you, which I find very exciting, this is the same mass to light that is observed everywhere. So mass from lensing and the light, of course, from the stars. So one question we ask is, how much of that mass and light comes just from the galaxies? Of course, the light comes just from the galaxies. How much of the mass comes just from the galaxies and their big halo, rather than have additional dark matter? And this blue band is what comes just from the galaxies' mass and their big dark matter halo when we calibrate it with the known mass of our Milky Way, Andromeda, other galaxies that we measure by some other means, and add the, a little bit amount of gas that we know exists there. So uh, we can see that you don't really need any additional dark matter within the uncertainties. Most of the mass, or all the mass that we see any place, just comes from the collection of the galaxies and all their dark matter halos, again, that 
Vera initially uh, started working. So this is a picture. You have a spiral or elliptical. You have a huge amount of uh, a halo, dark matter around it. 24 kiloparsecs or 50 kiloparsecs was around here initially, but it really extends, extends a, a factor of almost 10 bigger. So where is a dark matter? We believe that most of the dark matter is just in very big halos around galaxies. You get a picture where you have the light, which is just like a one or two percent of all uh, the mass. You have big dark matter, and when you have groups and clusters, like in this uh, uh, diagram, they are just the collection of all these dark matter halos. They are, of course, stripped the dark matter halos because of gravitational interactions, but they, they create the potential of the entire group and cluster. So where is a dark matter? It's traced by light and stars on large scales. Once you go to a, over a few hundred kiloparsecs, it can give you omega matter, and the total mass in stars is only 1% of the total mass in uh, the universe. So tiny amount is in stars, yet the stars know exactly where the dark matter is. That's why mass and light follow each other. And most of the dark matter is located in large halo around galaxies, uh, and groups, uh, clusters are made made up mostly by the galaxies themselves, their dark matter, and the voids, therefore, will have very little dark matter. So that's a clear prediction that voids will have just as much dark matter as comes with the galaxies. So when we look at a picture uh, like the distribution of galaxies in the universe, this would be the picture of the dark matter. It would follow uh, uh, the galaxies. So uh, let me end with uh, what Vera would uh, say about it, and in fact not would say, she did say that, and it's something she always enjoyed saying when we talked about. The joy and fun of understanding the universe is what we be bequeath to our grandchildren and their grandchildren. With over 90% of the matter in the universe still to play with, even the sky will not be the limit. And I know she will be delighted to hear all the progress made. Uh, I would also uh, like to say, announce, if you have not heard about it, that we are very pleased uh, that uh, the LSST, uh, there was a proposal uh, by uh, the House, HR 3196, and the NSF uh, uh, in France Cordova here, thank you very much, to name the uh, LSST the Vera Rubin Survey uh, Observatory. And that's just a wonderful tribute to uh, recognize Vera's contribution to astronomy. So thank you, Vera, my good friend. Thank you very much. Have you looked up asteroid 3196? No. What, what, tell us about I it. I want you to do so. I will. You want to tell us what? No. No. OK. <laughs> we will look it up. It does not have a name. It does not have a name. Oh, that's a good suggestion. <laughs> Very good. Paul? Oh. Um, with regard to the picture you drew, in which the dark matter is attached to halos, and the halos have light the sources from stars. Um, the plot that you gave of the mass to light ratio with radius went to well past the traditional definition of the edge of a virialized object we call a halo. Correct. R over R200 went well beyond 10 in order to uh, ac oh, yeah. accumulate it goes to all 40 or 50 it goes to it goes to the cosmic scale so i guess my question to you is 
um, while you may be correct in saying that it's flat as you go to larger and larger scale, and that the light itself isn't falling off any faster than the mass, um, to say that it's attached to um, objects um, rather than in the general um, uh, distribution of matter outside of virialized objects, I think is not fair. No, uh, l let me, it may, maybe I, I, I went over it quickly. Um, we can measure the mass in individual galaxies, like our Milky Way or other individual galaxies, so we, within some uncertainty, of course, large uncertainty, so we know how much mass is attached to individual galaxies up to the virial radius, which is about, let's say, 300 kiloparsecs for an Elster galaxy. If you take that mass per unit light for spirals and for ellipticals, put it together with a density morphology relation, you get all the mass that you get from lensing. Lensing doesn't care about virial, attached, not attached, just tells you how much potential you have there. When you add such galaxies in their halos, it gives you the entire mass uh, that you observe from lensing per unit light. And that's why I mean, that's what we mean by the uh, most of the mass that we see any place, filaments, voids, uh, uh, any place on the large scale of 30 megaparsecs. It's not virialized, it's not anything, it just as much mass as comes with whatever galaxies exist there. But you wouldn't say that the, uh, that therefore the average place where you put the dark matter was inside a virialized object, because it's beyond your R200. That's what I'm trying to say. It is not in a virialized object, and I don't think we should have that picture. The separation of the galaxy cores is less than 300 kiloparsecs in the center of the cluster. So, so in galaxies, it's all clear. It, you are virialized and you go to the, to the uh, uh, virial radius. In groups, clusters, again, the dark matter is within the virial radius. It's not attached anymore to the galaxies, but it's in that potential. Now, let's say you go to the filaments. Well, it follows the light in this filament with the same mass per unit light. I don't say it's virialized. It just follows the same amount. You don't need more dark. All I'm saying is you don't need more dark matter as you go to larger scale system. Uh, then, then just comes with the galaxies that make it up. You know, I think we're running late. So if you don't mind having this con continuing the conversation over the break, I think we should Thank Netta again for a wonderful talk.